Hey everybody, it's Jim of Anime Education. Today you're going to meet Andrew Chessworth, who is the animator and director of The Brave Locomotive. It took him a while to make this film. So here's my conversation with Andrew Chessworth. So when you were a kid, did you, did, how did you get into animation? I saw Dumbo on TV when I was like three. And I think just something about the flavor of that film ignited something in me. Uh, and I remember seeing other cartoons like The Brave Engineer uh, and like The Good Morning Mickey show, uh, show where they would show the Donald and Mickey shorts early in the morning when the kids are up. And just watching those cartoons, I think it just made me want to go into that world and, and and learn more about it. And I had an interest and a knack for drawing at a young age. So I think drawing as a toddler and then kind of taking in those old Disney cartoons it was just, it was getting the wheels turning that this was something I wanted to be a part of. I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And the reason I went there was because I didn't want to take out a loan for a more expensive, well-known school like CalArts or Ringling. And so I went to this portfolio fair in downtown Chicago and I met a bunch of recruiters. I learned about MCAD. I had a really good experience with that recruiter. My dad drove me up to Minneapolis, which was about a six hour drive from where we lived in Chicago. Uh, and I really liked the campus. I really liked the people there. I could see myself living there. Um, and so comparing that to some of the other schools I visited, that was how I made the decision. It was partly financial and partly comfort and proximity and being able to see myself going to that school. When I went to MCAT, I studied uh, hand-drawn 3D and stop motion all concurrently with each other. And when I was in school, Brother Bear had just come out my freshman year and then Incredibles came out my sophomore year. And I was starting to see like, oh, this is, this is the trajectory the industry is going in. And I'd already been comfortable with computers from my time in high school. I would do a lot of you know, side projects involving 3D animation with my friends in high school. So I had a, a comfort level with just interfacing with the software uh, in the early 2000s. And so I think I made the transition rather elegantly while in school and I was still learning both, but I had my eye on being a professional 3D animator, but I wanted to have that 2D skill set there just in case things ever turned around. Um, so when I graduated, I was applying to Disney, applying to Pixar, not getting in, but I did get asked to join a startup company right there in Minneapolis that was founded by a couple of my former classmates who were a couple years older than me. And so right out of school, I was doing commercials in both 2D and CG and uh, just cutting my teeth and getting really familiar with the work environment and working with clients and deadlines. And it kind of felt almost like an extension of school in a way. Like I graduated, but went right into an environment where I was still doing similar work of a similar scope, but now getting paid for it. And uh, I worked at that startup called Make for about four years. Uh, and every two years I would apply to Disney. And the third time I applied, I got in and, and brought into the talent development program during the production of Wreck-It Ralph in 2011. So that was great. It was like third time was the charm for me for Disney. <laughs> I went to your uh, the Asifa Hollywood event where you actually showed the Brave Locomotive. Yeah, thank and you for coming to that. It was yeah, great to see you there. That was great, and it was it was amazing to see you know that you started it like in two thousand eight or something like that. I started thinking about it in in the fall of two thousand eight as like this is something I want to do. You know, I didn't want to just make a bunch of clips for a demo reel. I wanted to make a film. Some of that was probably just the temerity of youth, you know, like I'm going to make a, a Disney film, like a, a throwback animated short that feels like it was straight from the 40s. And I'm going to use 3D animation to do some of the train stuff and hand drawn backgrounds and, and organic characters. And I, I always saw it kind of being done that way. Uh, but I was just way out of scope for what I could do as an individual at 23 years old. So I kind of did all the pre-production planning and story development and music development at that time. But then as I started physically making the film, I realized just how out of scope it was. And that's why it went on the shelf and came back many years later. 
<laughs> yeah, you you finished it during COVID, which I thought was a what a great project to you know to find. Yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I I had always wanted to finish it, and with with that project, the urge to make a 1940s musical throwback film, that broad urge never went away. It's like something that I wanted to do on my bucket list, eventually. And with COVID, it kind of made me realize I've got this audience from the opening sequence work print on YouTube, they're already interested and invested in, in this concept. I already want to do something that has this melody time flavor to it. Maybe I can just finally come together and finish it now. Like when, when else am I going to? And so that you only live once mentality, plus the independent animation movement that was starting to take hold online with Kickstarter and Patreon and just YouTube in general. That, that gave me the sense that if I make it, they'll see it. Like if you build it, they will come. That was kind of my mindset around the project. Mm -hmm. And then also you, you, so you were working at Disney and, and you got into that and you worked on like several big films. Yeah, <laughs> and, I had a great, uh, <clears throat> a great time there. Just yeah. a great time. And you worked on a, a, uh, trailer for the Palm Springs, I guess, That's right. festival or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I still, I still have people who tell me that's their favorite thing that I've ever done. Which is like, it's only fifty seconds long. It's an opener, like a sponsor opener for a film festival, and but I had total creative freedom on it. Like I got to do a, a 1940s, 50s style, hand drawn animated film noir. And it pastiches all the tropes of the genre in about 50 seconds, right? <laughs> there's like the femme fatale, there's the twist villain, there's the MacGuffin, and uh, the, the cops have a relationship with the detective that seems to have some history behind it. There's all these things that are uh, implicit to that genre that are just packed into that short little thing. And and even casting the voice actors, I was casting for just the most iconic voices I could find. And it was just a delight to work on. And as I mentioned at the Asifa thing, it, it got a lot of attention online at the time back in 2010 and even got, I think, noticed by Brad Bird and he commented on it on Cartoon Brew. And that just kind of blew my mind that, you know, some nobody animator kid from Minnesota could get some appreciation from their hero. It was that was a really meaningful project. And that one actually was a big learning experience for me that I was able to then apply to the locomotive short too. And then you, you worked on one of one of my uh, favorite films is the uh, one step, one small step. Mm -hmm. I guess you were did you do the storyboarding for that or that you came up with like some of the story and directing on that? Or? Yeah, I was a co-writer, co-director, and one of the story artists on it. Uh, my co-director, Bobby Pontius and I, he came up with the concept um, with our, another friend, Trent Corey at Disney. They pitched it at Disney and Disney didn't produce the film, but they were able to bring it to Tycho and then we redeveloped the project there. So after Moana, I was looking to do smaller things with a little more creative freedom again just looking at the long scope of my life ahead of me and what do I want to do with the time I have and doing kind of more, uh, more open-ended creative projects appealed to me. And uh, because I knew Bobby and Trent, they kind of knew I was interested in doing other things. And so they connected me with Tycho. Um, and yeah, I, before long, I was asked to co-direct on the film with Bobby and he and I wrote the film together with our producer, Shafu, and Bobby and I each storyboarded 50% of the film and uh, kind of pick sequences that we were more drawn to. And then Shafu and I edited the film together. Um, and I got to work closely with the composer while Bobby was working more closely with the visual development. So it was a real, real great collaborative experience making that film. Mm -hmm. And then after that, well, some time after that, you went... You got to work on Klaus. I Dude, did. The, how did you do that? <laughs> uh, I think Sergio had been following my 2D work from the Palm Spring short and the 11 Second Club 2D animation uh, post that I had done a couple years earlier. And I think as he was kind of looking around the animation landscape of who could help him with this hand-drawn feature he was producing in Europe, um, I was just on the list and he reached out to me and the timing worked out perfectly where I had worked on one small step, 
that was touring the the film festivals and kind of making itself known to the world. And Sergio reached out to me to help on Klaus and uh, it, it was just perfect timing. It had always been my dream to work on a hand-drawn film at the Disney level of quality. And it was funny that I had to work on a Netflix film to work on a Disney film, basically. <laughs> I mean, I, I, a classic looking Disney film. I loved the CG Disney films I worked on, but it was the hand-drawn films that made me want to be an animator in the first place. And so getting to work on a project at the level of quality of Klaus was there's no other career experience I've had like it. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. You also have taught at, uh, you taught at Car Cal Arts for a little bit, right? I did. I did. did that go? Uh, it was great. Uh, I was still at Disney at the time. I started my first semester of teaching fourth year character animation uh, during my last few months of Disney before I left to join Tyco. And then while I was developing one small step with Bobby and Shafu, I taught my second semester in the spring uh, and I, I enjoyed it. I would absolutely do it again if the circumstances were right. Uh, it was a long drive for me going from Burbank to Santa Clarita after my full-time job twice a week. So I think that kind of got to me a little bit. That's probably the main reason I'm not doing it right now, <laughs> especially now that we have two kids, you know, leaving in the evening twice a week after work would be a pretty big commitment, but uh, I loved the experience of it and yeah i would do it again but down the road <laughs> yeah right right and so now you, you're working as uh you're working for netflix is that right yep you're i'm so still with netflix so after klaus i got asked to be a character design supervisor on a show called my dad the bounty hunter and that was a result of the hand-drawn animation i had done on klaus they were looking for a character designer who had experience with 2d animation and could adapt some of the concepts that they had been working on into more fully realized animatable turns. So even though I was a lead, I was kind of like the, the packeting artist, the person figuring out the expressions, poses, streamlining things about the design to be more animation friendly in CG. Um, and I got to touch most of the main characters on the show, uh, but we had a, such a great design team on that show it felt like we were all making each other's lives easy. So that was a really great experience. Uh, and then after my dad, the bounty hunter, I briefly worked on James Baxter's team at Netflix before uh, some downsizing happened uh, within the, the Burbank feature department. And then immediately I was picked up on the, the Stranger Things animated show that's being made now in the same capacity that I was in on dad, uh, doing kind of character design packeting in general oversight for how the characters are adapted going into animation i haven't really seen any of that yet i, I haven't been following it either but is that <laughs> oh, there's nothing it's still it, out there or it's still yeah, being worked it's, on i guess it's it's uh it's being worked on um and it's been announced and that's all i can say is that Got it's it. announced and that i'm working on it they they're probably yeah i don't know when they plan on releasing any more materials but it's basically been announced and that's okay. it <laughs> Do you have any, uh, I don't know, advice for students, uh, like making their own films? Yeah, I would say don't make the mistakes I did with Brave Locomotive and bite off way more than, than you can chew to the point that it occupies some drawer in your mind for 15 years. Now, even though with my film, you could say 15 years in the making, it was really only like two productive years at the beginning of that timeline and two and a half productive years at the end of that timeline. So that was a long time to live with the film, but it wasn't necessarily a long time to be concurrently making a film. I would say three to four years or four to five years is pretty common for making an independent short. Uh, a colleague at Disney said, if you're doing something independently, it's basically operating at a quarter time as if you were doing it for your job, right? So if it's a film that would take you one year to make it a studio, it might take you four to five years to make on the side uh, because momentum is a big thing, you know, and drive and energy are, are big factors. And we're usually spent at the end of the day. And as we get older and like me, if you got a family and kids, it's, it's harder to kind of say, I'm going to work on this film instead of spend time with you. Right. It's, it's not really a responsible thing to do. So if I were to do a film now in my current station in life, 
I'd probably have two to three hours a night, a few days a week after the kids go to bed. And that's about it. So like, what can I do in six to eight hours a week? That's going to move the needle on a film and doing it all yourself is probably going to be really slow. Uh, doing it with a team is going to be a little faster, but there has to be something in it for everyone on the team. Like this person wants to be an art director. This person wants to be a production coordinator or manager or producer. This person wants to be a story artist or a head of story or a director. Everyone who you're collaborating with should have a stake in it. Don't just go around willy nilly asking people like, hey, will you work on my film? Because it might just put them in an awkward spot. You want to cast a team of collaborators that are all invested in it instead of just, you know, helping you finish your thing. So I, I think there's a lot of factors to consider. And also picking a concept. For me, I love musicals. I love trains. I love classic Disney animation. Whether I was 23 years old or 38 years old, I was excited to engage with the material and the tone of the material. So because it was a bucket list item for me, there was never a day where I was like, why did I pick this concept? I don't like it. It was like, no, this is something that brings me joy and I would like to finish it because I enjoy working on it. And now that it's done, there are days where I miss animating in that style. So I think to kind of have the energy to, to moonlight on something, it has to be something that's just fun to do or or meaningful for you. It doesn't even have to be something that's comedic or or lighthearted. It just has to be something that really pulls you in and makes you engage with it. So are, do you have any advice for students of today, what what they can do to, to get into the animation industry? To get into the animation industry, uh, if you want to work at a larger studio, whether it's like a Nickelodeon TV studio or like a Disney feature animation studio, you have to have a skill that's kind of seen as your your key skill that they can imagine you fitting into their pipeline. You know, most recruiters or directors are looking for people they can just fold right into their team. They're not, I mean, candidly looking for professional students. You can learn on the job and get better on the job, but most of the time when they're hiring, they want to look at your work and be like, ah, I can plug this right into what we're doing on our team. And it's going to be very cost effective and very comfortable for us. So there's this saying that, you know, people are hiring out of fear. Most of the time they, they want to make a more defensive decision that somebody that they hire is going to fit in. So your work should have at least a passing resemblance to the work of the studio that you're applying for. If you're applying to DreamWorks, you know, you probably don't want to send character designs that look like Adventure Time, unless DreamWorks is making a film that's specifically trying to look like Adventure Time, which might happen, who knows? But uh, generally speaking, you want to uh, fit into wherever you're applying. If you want to kind of be more free with different styles and different ways of expressing yourself, smaller studios, commercial studios, I think are are worth exploring. And Having worked at two startups, you know, Make and then Tyco Studios, I can tell you there's some really important lessons you learn at a startup that do apply to a large studio. And when I went from Make to Disney, some things were easier about Disney than Make. I didn't have to deal with clients anymore. I only had to deal with creative notes on the footage I was producing. I missed some of that uh, agility and freedom of being a part of the process that I had at make, but I became a much better animator as a result of working at Disney because that's what I was there to do. I was there to animate. So every job is going to be different and the scale of the studio is going to define how narrow your, your task is within that work environment. So just focus on what your core craft is. For me, I, I like doing a lot of things, but I would say my core craft is animating uh, and when I deviate from that, it's usually in a smaller context. What's next? Do you have any ideas for 2024? Yeah, I've got some ideas for projects I'd like to make, and I haven't decided which one I want to put a majority of my energy behind. But there's a few more independent shorts I'd like to make with crowdfunding and small teams like I did with the Brave Locomotive. And the challenge I'm setting for myself is like, how do I do that in a fraction of the time. So that's going to inform the production design, the creative structure, the, the story, and the scope of the story that's told. 
because uh, I want to do another hand-drawn film independently, but I don't want it to be 15 years of my life, maybe two to three at the most. Uh, and then on the professional side, I'm, I'm on Stranger Things for the foreseeable future. And I'm excited for more of that to be released and shared with the world. Uh, and there's a few ideas for projects I'd like to pitch within studios, but you know, I just had a son who was born, so I'm, I'm, I'm calibrating that, and then I'll start, you know, maybe putting more of my ideas in front of people again. But yeah, I just want to keep making things and being a part of great projects, and I've been very lucky to have been a part of many great projects in my career. Well, it sounds great, and uh, wish you all the best for the next year. And great having you on Animated Educated, and uh, can't wait to see what you do, you know, in the coming years. And uh, thank you, Jim. Appreciate yeah. it. It's been great to be here. Well, there you have it. Hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Andrew Chesworth. If you did enjoy this, you can press that button right there to subscribe, and uh, you can take a look at other videos I have up here that I've done, or you can scroll down and see more below. And we'll see you next time on Animated Educated.